Hello and welcome to episode three of Ask Keith Mills. Thank you very much for all of your questions. Let's get stuck straight in. So our first question comes from Matt Bush. And Matt wants to know how much does the mastering process really affect a track? Hi Matt, how's it going? So just to expand on this, I know that you're comparing your tracks two reference tunes when you're doing your mix down and they're not quite matching up and you're asking yourself you know okay is the big difference here in my mix down or is it the fact that they've had their track mastered well i've heard tracks that have had masters that have made a huge improvement and some that haven't done too much at all but in my experience the best sounding tracks are the ones that had a killer mix down in the first place and then the mastering process just adds that little bit of magic on the top so what I would recommend, firstly, when you're making that comparison is to get a similar volume. The mastered track is going to be louder than your mix down. So drop it down by a few dB and just use your ears to get a similar level. Moreover, though, the most important point, I think, is to remember that you're using this as a reference track to improve your tune. So the idea is it's more of a learning tool and it's a guide to improve your track, but you're not trying to match it. You're not trying to use it as a benchmark because if at the moment there's quite a big difference and it sounds like there is, then that benchmark is a little bit too unachievable and that's actually going to just have the effect of disheartening you. Far better is to just use it as a learning tool and to compare your mix down when you finished to previous mix downs. I would normally say compare your last three tracks to the three tracks that went before because then what you're doing is trying to better yourself rather than trying to take too big of a step and it's much more encouraging when you see the progress that you're making. So I hope that helps, take care. Next up is a question from Nam. Nam asks, how do you pick individual sounds that will play well together or complement each other? Hi Nam, so I think there's two sides to this. The first is picking sounds that complement and the other is picking sounds that actually contrast because if we've got too many sounds that are really complementing each other, then none of them will particularly stand out. So when we're looking at complementing or really sounds that gel together, I guess is what I'm talking about here, you might be looking at things like making sure they're all playing you know, harmoniously. So we're looking at our actual musical notes and how they work together. Also things to look out for are question and answer phrases. Can you think of a way that your new sounds pattern might work as an answer to an existing sounds phrase? Then of course you've got things like effects, so maybe you'd be putting your sounds in the same space using, for example, reverb. On the flip side, we've got looking for contrast in sounds. So you mentioned in your question as well um, something about the, the spectrum, the frequency of sounds. Absolutely, be looking for some spare space in the frequency range. So for example, looking for a, a free octave that you could use that no other instruments are playing, that would work really well. Then there's the characteristics of the sound to think about and the way that the patterns are playing. If you've already got sounds that are playing sustained notes, perhaps go for something staccato. If you've got quite soothing, calm sounds, maybe go for a distorted lead. So really what I'm saying is before you start kind of endlessly flicking through presets, it's often a good idea to ask yourself, what is the role of this new sound? What do I want it to do? Is it at the front of the track? Is it a supporting element? Consider the kind of feeling that you want it to convey and then go in search of the right sound for your tune. Hope that helps. Okay, so our third question comes from Ken Gorski. Ken says that he plays in a MIDI drum loop, but wants to know how to work out what BPM it is before he starts adding other elements into his track. Hi Ken, so my understanding is that you're playing your drums in without any kind of metronome or anything, and you're starting your project with them, and it's just how you feel on the day, and that dictates the BPM and how the drums uh, are getting recorded in. The issue you're having though is that you then need to get that lined up with your grid so you can start programming in other elements. What I would recommend you do is exactly as you are now, record your drums in, then loop up a couple of bars of it because you'll be able to hear that without working out the BPM. 
once you've got a loop working then you can use the metronome and adjust the BPM inside of your DAW until you've got both of those things running just at a similar speed that will do so kind of like a DJ mixing two tracks together once you've got the speed worked out of course you can then play your drums in again only this time you've got the metronome going so maybe your drum playing will be that little bit tighter and you'll be able to easily quantize whatever you want to the grid and build your track from there. So it's a nice quick process and it allows you to have that freedom of starting your track unrestricted with any sort of metronome or beats or any other sounds whatsoever. I hope that works for you. Okay, the final question in this episode is from Andy Garrett and Andy sent in four questions but I've got a feeling that he wanted me to go for the most controversial one so I'm not going to disappoint. Let's get stuck in with this. Andy asks, Logic has a better sound engine than live, fact or fiction? Great question, Andy. Well, these days I think they're very, very similar. I mean, it's certainly fiction to say there's a better uh, sound engine. To my knowledge, they're exactly the same. And certainly I've seen various blind tests and null tests, and there's never been a discernible difference. Certainly nothing in the null tests that the human ear would pick up. Now, there was still a question over the overall sound quality because Logic did have better audio plugins and Live didn't have plugin delay compensation, um, for example. However, now the PDC is in place and we've got amazing new filters in the latest update of Live. The EQ is really on point. There's things like convolution reverb. So really, Live is very much a contender now, I think, on the sound quality front. When you also add into all the creative possibilities that it offers, for me, it's still leading the pack, but that's my personal preference now. So cue an absolute avalanche of comments disagreeing with me, but that's my opinion, and now I'm going to stick with it. So that's rounded off this episode nicely. Thanks again for all the questions you're sending in. If you have already had one of your questions answered, don't let that stop you from sending in some more totally cool the more the merrier so once again to ask a question it's hashtag ask Keith Mills on Twitter or Instagram and that's just the same as writing a normal tweet or putting in a comment on Instagram just stick hashtag ask Keith Mills at the start or the end and we'll pick that up if you're not on either of those platforms and you'd rather use the contact form it's beneath this video stick your question in fire it over I'd love to hear from you all the best take care